Father, this morning. We stand before thee, Lord, in your house, in thy presence, as vessels, in the Master's hand. Only you know, Lord, the purpose for which each one is called. Only you, Lord, can cleanse each one of us. Only you, Lord, can fill each one of us. Only you, Lord, can use us for your glory. The Father, this morning we stand once again in surrender. Surrender of our hearts our minds, our will, our emotions, our body. Speak to us. For the entrance of your word brings light. And your word says, if we walk in the light, then we have fellowship. True, genuine fellowship with you. And with one another, speak to us so that we may walk in that light, O Lord. Speak to us and empower us. Because we confess once again our weakness that without you, we cannot do anything. I cannot speak. I cannot hear. I cannot believe. I cannot walk. Unless you move. In each one of us. So we surrender, Lord, that you might move in us. Speak to us. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. As we continue our study from last week, uh, first let me tell this to the church. Church, young ones in the Lord who struggle with sarcasm when you go back to your colleges, your schools, your workplaces. The world and the devil will judge you by your past. The Lord judges you by your present. He never judges you by your past. Okay? He never judges you by your past. If your past is under the blood, he says, I don't even remember. The only time he remembers is when you go and remind him. He doesn't even allow the devil to open his mouth about your past, if it's under the blood. So don't worry about what the devil says. Don't worry about what the world says about your past. Be concerned about what God says. If he says, as far as east is from the west, I have removed, it's removed. If he says it's at the deepest part of the, of the sea. Right? I saw a illustration of a surprise look of a cat which says they can track my phone but they cannot find a plane right how many days two weeks with all this satellite technology they cannot find a plane where do you think they will find your sins God says I have thrown it into the bottom of the sea let them try with all this satellite technology they won't find it Okay, so don't worry about what the world says, what the devil says. Be concerned only about what a God says. Why? Because nobody is a finished product the day they are saved. You're all on the way, but be sure you are on the way. That narrow way. So we looked last Sunday, we saw the three major things everybody struggles with. And sometimes we confuse one with the other. These are major hindrances, and the remedy for the hindrances are different. They are not the same. And we said these three major hindrances. What is it? First, sin or sins. Second is wounds. And the third is demonic oppression. Okay? Sins need to be repented of. There is no healing for sins. There is no casting away of sins. This forsaking of sins, 
but you cannot command this sin to go away. You need to repent. In the same way, there is no repenting of wounds. There is no casting away of wounds. Wounds need healing. And demons, you don't repent of demons. Nor do you lovingly pray for healing over demons. They will only go a little more deeper inside. They need to be cast off. But sins are the outward symptoms. Like when you go to a doctor, he first checks your symptoms before he goes for further tests. Now, old days, I don't know whether doctors do it anymore. Old days, when you went to a doctor, what did he ask you to do? Stick your tongue out. Okay? Which is true with God too. When you go to God, what does he say? Stick your tongue out. Do you know what he said? Because that's when sin takes, becomes visible. But sins can be a manifestation or often is a manifestation of deeper problems. Repeated sins can be also a coping mechanism for deeper problems. And some of the problems may be wounds. A lot of young mothers in the house, older parents in the house, and we all know we give our children two kinds of toys. One is a toy they can play with, it doesn't make any sound. But some toys, when you press it, what do you happen? It squeaks. Right? Sometimes we do not realize some of the reactions of people is because you press them at a wound. Okay? May look normal, but supposing a kid has got an injection, looks normal, but you touch over there, it will scream, and you will be wondering what happened? Some of those outbursts of anger, a lot of manifestations of sin can be because there is a wound which has not been healed. And the devil knows how to use people to keep pressing on that wound. We are not looking at wounds today. Okay, We are not looking at wounds today. But I am saying, unless God shows us and we go to God with an open heart, we go to God, that's where discernment is required. Lord, show me. The reason is, I want to walk with you. What is stopping my walk with you? Is it just sin? Is there a deeper wound? And wounds can also become, after a period of time, demonic strongholds, where they now control ungodly behavior. Ungodly behavior. So we have to be careful whether it is sins, wounds, or demonic oppression. But the doorway to all three, the first step is always the same. And therefore the first step is the most important step. Whether it is a wound, whether it is a demonic oppression, or whether it is just sin. The first step always in the Bible is called repentance. If you want total de deliverance, deliverance, okay, you can be healed of a wound and yet not be delivered. The man, 38 years, who is crippled, Jesus says, do you want to get well? He makes all excuses. Jesus says, pick up your mat and walk. He picked up his mat and walked. He did not even know who had healed him. He didn't even know it was Jesus. But he went to the temple. And there Jesus met him and told him something in his ear. He told him, your wound, literal physical wound, was a result of sin. Don't sin again or something worse will happen. Okay? Repentance is the first step. And repentance always, not almost always, always primarily includes this. What is it? Personal responsibility. That's why people don't like repentance. If repentance in actual English means blame your wife, everybody will love repentance. Blame your neighbor. But repentance basically means take personal responsibility for your fault in the mess. Are we getting the picture? It includes that. Doesn't matter how oppressed one is. Remember last week we looked at a man who was demon possessed. How many did he have? A legion. 
How much is a legion? Anywhere between three to six thousand demons were in him. But look at Mark chapter 5 and verse 6. Mark chapter 5 and verse 6. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and... Did you see this? Let's put the maximum figure. He had 6,000 demons. Agreed? Yet did God allow the demons to completely take over his will? No. And when Jesus actually went over to this man, and when Jesus went over, he in his will still chose to run and fall at his feet. You know what that is? It's called taking personal responsibility for your problem. And then his deliverance begins. So, there is nobody here, I believe, with 600 demons. God says it's easier for any one of us to fall at his feet. Nobody would have gone there, honestly, because they knew what he was. Nobody could have taken him to Jesus either, because he was violent. Even chains couldn't hold him. He himself did not have the power to actually come to Jesus. So what did Jesus do? Jesus went to him. You have to understand the heart of God. One tiny flicker towards God. We ran today. We sang today. What is that? If we run to him, he will run to us. Somewhere on the other side, in, in, among the tombs, is a man screaming, cutting himself. But in his heart, there is a flicker saying, I don't know what it was. Lord, would you deliver me? Immediately the spirit of the Lord told his son, get into the boat and go to that side. He cannot come. He cannot be brought. Only you can go to him. And when he reached over there, scripture says, he ran. And he worshipped. And he was delivered. The question is, will we take personal responsibility for our part? Let me put it across this way so that we understand it well. Calvary... Richie, Calvary will not cover what I will not uncover. Getting the picture? The blood of Jesus was shed at Calvary, but Calvary will not cover what I will not uncover. The blood of Jesus will not cover any sin of mine which I have been uncovered before him. Repentance, therefore, means I take personal responsibility for my part in my mess. And God says, that's all you need to do. In the Old Covenant, the day Israel was delivered out of Israel, uh, Egypt, they had to do one thing. They had to kill the Passover lamb. We all know the story. They had to kill the Passover lamb, eat for a family, kill it, eat it, take the blood with hyssop, collect the what, blood in the basin, Take the hyssop, which is by faith, actually put the blood on the lentils of the house. And then, there was one more thing they had to do. Did you know there was one more thing they had to do which was absolutely important? You will see in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 22. You shall take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lentil and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall... Go out at the door of his house until the... That is the condition. God says, You really want to walk in victory with me till the day morning comes when Jesus comes. Stay under the blood. Stay under the blood. If you step outside the blood, there is no protection. That is why we keep focusing on this. How do I come back under the blood? Because we all tend to sin. When people pray the way we pray, people often get very offended because you have been taught in many, many different places. Once you have repented, that is all. You are righteous forever. At one level, which is true, which is called positional righteousness, but at another level, it is not true. Why? Because we all fall daily. We all have to come back to Christ. We all have to come back under the blood because scripture says, if we confess, he is faithful. We have to stay under the blood daily. 
One of the first truths you will learn in the gospel is grace. Everybody needs grace. Grace and truth always go together. They are conjoined twins. Cannot be separated. You know what it means? Grace will never come in where truth is not allowed. Grace will never come in where truth is not allowed. So the first work of the Holy Spirit is not grace. The first work of the Holy Spirit is connected with truth. Will you let truth in? Why? Because grace wants to come in. And our issue, honestly your issue, my issue, our issue is always with truth. And in truth, what happens? Confession is always involved. That's why scripture says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, confession is involved. Let's look at um, Isaiah when he has this vision of God. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, he sees the vision of God. First thing he says is, Woe is me for I am man undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of first glimpse of God as truth, or truth as God, or first glimpse, what is he realizes? He is aware of his sinfulness. Does he make a confession? As soon as he makes a confession, what is God's solution? I will cleanse you. With what? With blood and with fire. Where is the fire taken off? It is taken from the basin that holds the blood. Without confession, there is no cleansing. There is absolutely no cleansing. In James chapter 5 and verse 16, Confess your trespasses to one another, Pray for one another that you may be, you may be, doesn't say be, be forgiven. Let me explain to you. There is sin. You have sinned over and over and over and over and over again, let's say in the same area. Now what has happened? It has become iniquity. You know what is iniquity? Iniquity is a bent. Now we are bent towards that. Now you keep on going in that cycle. Now if you go to God and confess that God forgive you, He forgives you. But how do you take care of iniquity? To be broken from iniquity, God says, you have to confess it before man. Then you are free. Otherwise you keep on coming to me 70 times 7 a day, I will forgive you. But you will not get out of that cycle. To get out of the cycle, you go to man, go before like Zacchaeus and say, you know what, half my wealth I will give it to the poor from all who have stolen. I will give four times over. God says you're free. You will never do it again. What if he had only gone to God and said, Lord, I am so sorry. I am thank you. came to my house after Jesus. Everybody has left. He sits in his prayer closet and says, Lord, I will return. Two days later, what will you think? Why should I return? Why should I sell my wealth? It's my wealth, right? Maybe I will sell a portion and give it to the beggars. We come up with a lot of our own ideas and we never break out of iniquity. Why? Because iniquity is a wound which needs healing. It needs healing. Iniquity says you will call it by name before man. And then that person who prays the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Otherwise, we will never get out of that cycle. We are forgiven. Yes, we are forgiven. We are always forgiven. God forgives. But God says, you know what? You will actually never have a victorious life on earth because you are so miserable. If all you do seven days a week is just come to confess the same sin over and over, aren't you miserable? At least there will be some joy in your life that the next time you go, it's a new sin you confess. Not the same thing. God also says it's so monotonous, come with some new things. Why are you not able? Because this is very difficult. Because this is connected with the reputation. Oh, what will he or she think of me? God says, it's up to you. You want to, you value your deliverance more than Your reputation or not. 
Because of Calvary, sin cannot keep you and me away from God. But pride does. Pride does. Pride keeps people from God. Sin doesn't. That's why pride is one of the worst manifestations of sin because it stops a sinner from coming to actually God. Pride builds walls of shame and guilt. Pride also keeps you from taking personal responsibility. Do you know that it is an actual possibility that we could know our Bible inside out, regular in Sunday attendance, and not be saved? I know these things scare people. This is not to scare, this is to know. I am not talking about perfection or anything. Don't start another rumor, Pastor, again, be priest. Only perfect people go to heaven. That's not what I'm talking about either. Why do I say so? I want to go back to the core text, Romans 1, verses 16 and 17. Mark this in your Bible, okay? This is what started the Protestant Reformation. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, in what? For in the gospel of Christ, in it, the gospel of Christ, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let me ask you this question. What is the gospel of Christ? Because scripture says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because in it, in the gospel of Christ, there are many things. One, in it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Doesn't matter whether you are a Jew or a Greek. Jew or Gentile, for everyone... The power of salvation lies in what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. But also in the gospel of Jesus Christ, what is there? What is revealed? The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So what is the gospel of Christ? Let us look at what the gospel of Christ is first. Because honestly, you know, I, look, I see faces. I know everybody is hoping pastor doesn't ask me. Because everybody suddenly realized, I don't know what actually the gospel of Christ is. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. I don't know where the wooden pointer went, but okay, we'll use this. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you stand. First statement. Brethren, I declare to you what? The gospel of Christ which I preached which you received and in which you stand. You know what is the gospel? It is this. By which also you are saved. If you hold fast that the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now verse 3 and 4 will tell you what is the gospel. Verse 3. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. It is not that Christ died. Christ died according to the scriptures, that he had to be the spotless, blemishless Lamb of God. That he had to die exactly the way the scriptures had prophesied and had to die on the cross. He died according to the scriptures. Two, that he was buried. Three, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You know what this is? This is the gospel of Christ. This is what you believed. Now go back to Romans. The question is, listen carefully, okay? Then only we will understand. Because sometimes this whole passage is misunderstood. What is the revelation here? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel of Christ? Christ Jesus died for my sins. He was buried and he rose on the third day. That is the gospel? If so, in that gospel... How is the righteousness of God revealed? What is the righteousness of God? What does it mean? 
It means it reveals his holiness. It reveals his purity. It reveals his undefiled character. It reveals his justice. How is it revealed? In the gospel, according to Christ, the holiness, the righteousness, the purity, the undefiled nature of God is revealed saying that not even one sin will ever go unfin unpunished. Look at the cross. He died for your sins. The holiness of God is revealed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. No sin will ever go unpunished. He died on the cross according to the scriptures. Are we getting the picture? Unless we understand that is the revelation. The revelation is in the gospel. There is a revelation of the righteousness of God. What is the righteousness of God? God is so holy. God is so pure. God is so undefiled. Every sin of every man will be judged. And the wages of sin is death. And Christ died for my sins. Not only he died, he was buried. Not only he was buried, he rose again. So if I come to him by faith, I have hope. Otherwise, there is no hope for mankind. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, we see the revelation of the holy and righteous character of God. So, what does the gospel of Christ demand? If this is the gospel of Christ, what does it demand? In Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47. Then he said to them, Thus it is necessary, and thus it was, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. He says, now do you understand? He says, Christ had to die. Christ had to be buried. Christ has to raise up all for what? For the sins of man. You go and preach what? Repentance. Without repentance, there is no remission of sins. The problem is, when the gospel is begun in meetings with the assurance that God loves you and God has a great plan for you, one becomes secure in an absolutely false peace. There is no such gospel. Nobody ever preached that gospel in the Bible. You cannot start a meeting for 10,000 people who do not know Christ by saying, God loves you, God wants to bless you. God says no. What you tell them is, look at the cross. That's what your and my sin did. You don't have to point at the sins of the people. You have to point at the sins of the people that was put on Christ. You cannot have another gospel. Every other gospel that begins in any other way is false. It gives you a false peace. In 1 Corinthians 1.23, you know what Paul says? Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling to the Jews, a stumbling block to the Greeks, foolishness. Why is Christ crucified a stumbling block to the Jews? Why is Christ crucified foolishness to the Gentiles? Think about it. Can we believe in a false gospel where there is no repentance? There is no turning away from sin daily? Ask this question. Do we see on the cross the mangled body of Christ hanging because of what? Because of the righteousness of God? The wrath of God on sin? If there is no revelation of the righteous character of God, then there is no repentance needed. And if there is no repentance needed, there also will be a set of people in whose hearts there is no gratitude. People who have understood the revelation of the cross will never come to God and complain. They actually say, Lord, even if you didn't do anything for me for the rest of my life, the cross is enough. 
How can I go from you? In Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 21 to 22. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned them from their evil ways and from the evil of their doings. Did that happen? God is saying, if the, pre, if the gospel is the gospel of Christ, and if somebody receives the gospel of Christ, what will happen? They would have turned them from their evil way. Turned them from their evil way. Did that happen? Practicing false or preaching false peace through the blood of his cross without repentance. Jeremiah 6.14 6 and verse 14. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly. What did they say? Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Healed it very slightly. When there is no peace. He says, no. I want to heal. And I want to do a deep work, a genuine work of repentance. But he says, it will not happen unless you preach the cross. Be careful. In the last days, much of the gospel that is being preached is false. Because there is no uh, repentance being preached because it upsets people. Really, really upsets people. And be careful, there is deception on the other side also. One, they will not insist on repentance. Two, they will teach a legal repentance. What is legal repentance? A desire to be saved from the consequences of sin while they still love sin. Revelation chapter 2 verses 14 and 15, there is a doctrine mentioned there. On Wednesday, Vijay was talking about doctrines of men and the doctrine of God. I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of whom? Of Balaam. Doctrine. The way of Balaam, the error of Balaam and the doctrine of Balaam. What is the doctrine of Balaam? This is a doctrine. So we have to see what is the doctrine of Balaam. Turn to Numbers chapter 24 and verses 2 to 5. Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel camped according to the tribes and what came? And the Spirit of God came upon him. Okay, so now what he is speaking is what he is seeing through the Spirit. He took up his oracle and said, The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of the man whose eyes are open, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel. What is he seeing? He is seeing the end of Israel. And he says, wow. Is this what salvation means? I love it. I love it. Verse 10. One second, one second. Where he says, I want to die. The death of the righteous. Verse 10, 23, 23, 23 and verse 10. Yeah, not 24, but 23 and verse 10. It's again his oracle. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous. Let my end be like this. He sees all this vision and he says, you know what? I want that. What is that? We hear about Jerusalem. We hear about New Jerusalem. We hear about this city. We hear about all the things of heaven. And you say, you know what? I want that. I really want that. I mean it. I'm very serious, Pastor. I really want that. But there is a problem. In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 15. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, 
the son of Beor who loved the wages of unrighteousness. This is the doctrine of Balaam. What is that? They want heaven when they die. They want to live like a son of hell on earth. When I'm on earth, I want the life of sin. I like it. I love it. But when I die, I want to go to heaven. We're getting the picture? Parallel. Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 to 33 to 41. Not 23, 33 to 41. Got it? Here another parable. There was a certain land owner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, built a tower, he leased it to wine dressers, went into a far country. When the vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the wine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the wine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then at last of all he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the wine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him, cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those wine dressers? God is asking a rhetorical question. Now go back to the beginning of it. Then we will get understand what Jesus is actually talking. The landlord is God. We are the garden. And he went to a far country. When vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the wine dressers that might receive fruit. Did they like it? Verse 35. They took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Let me ask you this question. Why was every prophet, Jesus says, in the old covenant killed? Everyone who was killed. Was it because of their miracles? Was it because of their blessings? Why? Because of only one message. What was that message? Of repentance. That is why they were killed. They came and said, show us the fruit of your repentance. And they were killed. The last of the old covenant priests. Okay, let's look at Luke chapter 3. Verses 7 to 8. Then he said to the multitudes that came to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, who want you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. What was the issue here? The issue was, he says, show the fruit of your repentance. That was the issue from the beginning. With every prophet, people had an issue. The only issue was, when there was a message of repentance, they got mad. Every other message, they were very happy. Why was John killed? Mark chapter 6, verses 17 to 20. Look at exactly why John was killed. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John, bound him in his prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Herod took his brother Philip's wife forcibly and married her. And what did John say? Repent. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore, Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. Who wanted to kill? Not Herod. Herodias wanted to kill, but she couldn't kill unless he gave the order. But Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and a holy man, and he protected him. Did he repent? He did not repent. He knew he was just. He knew he was holy. He knew everything that he was saying was right too. But he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard them gladly. Except one thing. That's the problem. When God comes and speaks, we will do many things. Except 
one thing. One thing was the problem. What was that? He said, get rid of that wife of yours. That is your brother's wife. Give, give her back. That you won't do. So what happened? That message was displeasing. Ask yourself, why was John the Baptist killed? Because he asked one couple to repent. That's why Jesus says, repentance will always precede remission of sins. Now let us go back to Matthew 21, that portion, and verse 38. So God says, every prophet of mine, Jesus says, from who? Abel to Zacharias, whom he killed between the altar. He says, you kill them all. Now let me ask you this question. Why was Abel killed? Abel is well and alive here. We are talking about the other Abel. Why was Abel killed? Because Abel's life demanded Cain's repentance. And he was not willing to repent. That's why he killed Abel. Abel was a living testimony to Cain. Repent and you will be accepted. What did Cain say? I will kill the testimony. Then who is there to tell? Me? Repent. From Abel onwards, everyone was killed for this one message. What did they say? When the wine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Listen, listen carefully. Look at there. Let us kill him, but seize his inheritance. We want the inheritance, but, but let us kill him. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Repentance is death. We want his inheritance, kill him, but. Now, are you getting the picture what God is saying? The last day's false deception gospel is, they will use the death of Christ to seize his inheritance. They will use the death of Christ. Without dying, that's why Paul says with tears, I'm telling you, brethren, people are the enemies of the cross. They want the inheritance. They will seize forcibly the inheritance. Says, brother, it doesn't matter. Name it, claim it, grab it. What are you grabbing? Inheritance. How? At his death. Are we getting the picture? Look at Romans 8 and verse 17. As to God telling us, how does the inheritance come? If we children, we are heirs. What did they say? He is the heir. And God says, yes, he is the heir. And what are you? Heirs of God, joined heirs with Christ, if indeed we... Did you know repentance is really suffering? If you are used to wake up, waking up at 8.45 and coming to church at 9.45, God tells, wake up and reach on time. It's, it's painful. It involves repentance, change of attitude, change of mind, change of everything. It is painful. We think of suffering, of dying for Christ in a foreign mission field. God knows. He says, no. Every small thing where change is required is suffering. And he says, pick up the cross and follow me. You have to die to yourself over there. He says, then you know what? You are a heir. What did they say? No, kill the heir and seize the inheritance. Did you know repentance has works? Repentance has fruit. Luke chapter 3, where we looked. Therefore bear Fruits worthy of repentance. What did they say? Do not begin to say what? We are? What does it mean? We are Abraham's sons means what? We are heirs. We are joined heirs. We are the sons of Abraham. The promises has been given to us. We are heirs. God says produce fruit worthy of repentance. That's how it shows you whether you are an heir or not. They got upset. Acts chapter 26, verses 20 and 21. 
Therefore King Agrippa I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision but declared first to those in Damascus in Jerusalem throughout all the region of Judea then to the Gentiles that they should repent turn to God and do what works befitting repentance for these reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to why why did they try to kill Jesus sorry Paul because he preached repentance that's why scripture says Christ the cross Christ crucified is a stumbling block to the Jews even till today Christ Jesus is a stumbling block to the Jews let me ask you this question when was the temple destroyed 70 AD Titus came in destroyed is there a temple there so for the past almost 2000 years 9, 1900 80 or odd years there is no temple there is no sacrifices there is no day of atonement where is your salvation coming in to come from if you are under the law where is your salvation there is no priest to offer the day of atonement the blood but still we will not accept Christ as messiah we will not we will wait for the final temple to come then we will offer work out our own salvation under the law god says you know what christ crucified is a stumbling stone to the jews and to the greeks with their wisdom and intelligence foolishness what are you talking about why for both it involves repentance and they will not they will not repentance is a issue of the pride of the ego and unless that's why god says it's the poor in the spirit who will receive the gospel are we getting the picture what god is talking about so god says in romans chapter 1 now 16 to 18 For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first also for the Greek for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness where is it revealed that's a fundamental question the wrath of god is being from heaven is being revealed where in the gospel in the gospel not only the salvation of god is revealed first what is revealed the wrath of god is revealed where he says look at the cross that's my son do you see why he's hanging there like that because sin will never escape punishment The wrath of God is revealed through the gospel of Jesus Christ where Christ is preached crucified against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who hold who suppress the truth in unrighteousness how do they suppress it they will say we will work out our own salvation god understands it doesn't matter are we getting the picture this is what god is talking about it is revealed in the gospel the price his son paid to appease that wrath until we see how grievous the nature of sin is we will not repent or change our direction matthew chapter 9 verses 12 and 13 when jesus heard that he said to them those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick go and learn what this means I desire mercy and not sacrifice for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. He says if you think you're spiritually well you don't need me. If you do not know how grievous sin is you look at the cross and you realize this is the punishment for sin and no sin is going to escape God's eyes every sin will be justly judged and looking at it and you say but i am fine god says you don't need me the one who looks at the cross and says lord i am doomed he says i am your healer i am there for you so in the gospel both is revealed what is revealed the wrath of god and the salvation of god both is revealed in the scripture so what is the gospel if anybody asks you now what is the gospel go to first corinthians 15 and says christ died he was buried he rose up on the third day that is the gospel and i look at it i believe i repent and i turn back to god 
and I am saved. And I am being saved. Why? Because daily I am turning back. We'll come to that. I am turning back. On the day of Pentecost, let me ask you this question. What did Peter preach? Peter preached, did you know that Christ crucified? Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. He says, Christ who was crucified is the Savior. Your sins are on there. You believe, you repent, call upon him, you are saved. That's what he preached. And what does scripture say in the next verse? They were cut to the heart. Does it say verse 37? They were cut to their heart. When they heard this, they were cut. These are people who are all under the law. They had come to Jerusalem to observe the festival. They were all under the law. But when they heard Christ crucified being preached, they were cut to the heart. And they asked, what should we do? What should we do? When they heard, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? What did he say? Repent. And be baptized. Repent. He says, there is a turning away. There is a turning away. Let me ask you this question. Why are you a Stephen killed? Acts chapter 7 is Stephen's great sermon. Starting from Abraham or before Abraham, he is giving the entire history of Israel. Then he comes to chapter 7 and verse 51. You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. Now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through the angels, but have not obeyed it. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. First part, what did he say? Christ was crucified, Christ was buried, and you killed him. Then Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God said, Look, I see the heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What is that? Christ rose again. When they heard that second part of the gospel, they covered the ears and they killed him. What did he preach? Whole history of Israel, they had no issue. When he preached Christ crucified, Christ buried, Christ rose again, they killed him. Because that demanded they have to repent. And they were not willing to repent. They were not willing to repent. Are we seeing the picture? Did you see the gospel being preached produces the wrath of men? In John chapter 17, Jesus in his high priestly prayer, before he himself becomes the atonement, in John 17 and verse 25, you know what he says? Oh, what did he say? He saw the justice of God and he knows you're righteous. That's why I'll be slain tomorrow. I understand your justice. If you have to forgive this set of people, the mankind, then your justice has to be fulfilled, O oh, righteous Father. And he is going to be the atonement. He is knew that the righteousness of God demands justice. That's why Moses, in his last prayer, addressed to Israel, says, all his ways are righteous. Judgment, justice. He's looking at all the people dead. And he realizes they didn't believe in the atonement. They walked in disobedience. So your ways are perfect. Romans 7, 12 to 13. Let's see what this says. Therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin 
that it might appear sin was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. We didn't get the picture. Young people, listen. Don't get distracted. I'll call you by name. If you don't want that, that wrath. <laughs> okay, keep your eyes focused here. Sin through that commandment might become exceedingly sinful. You know what the world does? world does the opposite. They change it so that sin doesn't look sinful anymore. Sex is made into a joke. Porn is made into a rights issue. I'm giving an illustration. Then suddenly, a commandment comes. A verdict is pronounced. Nirbhaya case. Four sentenced to death. Shakti Mills case. Yesterday, verdict comes. Four sentenced to life. Sentence. Suddenly what happens? That commandment has suddenly made what was the guilt? Sex, right? Exceedingly sinful. Till those verdicts come, we look at it, we watch it, we see it, we hear it, nobody is bothered until the verdict comes. God says, there is sin. But when the commandment of God came through the law, this is what I am, this is what I expect, sin became exceedingly sinful. Sin becomes exceedingly sinful. What did these verdicts for us as Indians in this country show? It showed us the utter sinfulness of sin. There is sin, whether we know it or not. But when the law comes... When we start studying the word of God, when we read the Ten Commandments, when we understand the character of God, sin becomes exceedingly sinful. Before that, it's just a voice in the conscience saying, don't do that, don't do that. Why? We do not know. Daddy, I said, mommy, I said, don't lie. But when we read the scripture and God says, you shall not bear false witness, then suddenly sin becomes exceedingly sinful. Thou shall not kill. You suddenly realize sin becomes exceedingly sinful. That's where the word comes in. The whole power of the law. What is the whole power? That's what verse 12 says. Verse 12 says, Therefore the law is holy, the commandment holy, just and good. What is the command? Why is it holy? Because it comes from, it reflects God's nature. The whole power of the law, that is it is holy, just and good, was made to bear on Christ. He took the full brunt of the law. When we see that in the gospel, that's the only time we will turn away from sin. That's when we will turn away from sin. When we see the entire weight of the law falls upon somebody, we will say, wow, it's not good to do this. Now let me ask you this question. If they publicly in front of the cameras, hang all these men. People will realize the horror of the act. We shouldn't have done it. Getting the picture? God says, you want to understand the horror of sin? Look at the cross. Look at my son hanging there in public. The horror of it. Sin became exceedingly sinful. And the whole weight of the law was put on him. The whole weight of the law. Would the cross shock me? That is the gospel. That's what scripture is talking about. The righteousness of God is revealed. What is revealed? We are looking at what I can get. We are not looking at the holiness of God. My gosh, God will do this to his own son? Is this how holy he is? Do we understand how the commandment is? What is the nature of God? Romans 5.25, the justice of God. 4 and verse 25. 
who was delivered up because of our offenses. Why was he delivered? For our offenses. That is why he was delivered. That's what will actually bring repentance. Our, everything else is just a legal repentance saying, okay, I'm going to heaven. So let me, God says, doesn't change people. Doesn't really change people. Let's go back to Romans 1, 16 to 17. A righteousness of God that is revealed from what? Faith to faith. God knows how to grab our attention. He knows how to grab our attention. So he knew how to get David's attention. So what did he go to go to David and say? He sent. He knew David wouldn't come to him. Because hiding in self-righteousness and shame and pride. So what did he do? God sent his servant to David. What did his servant say? He told his servant a story. He said, David, there was a rich man, many flocks. There was a poor man. What did he have? A lamb. Struck a cord. Why? What was David earlier? A shepherd. Many lambs he had carried. Many lambs he had nursed more than his own children. Many lambs he had rescued from the paws of the lion and the bear. Hit him there. And he said, you know what? This guy, this rich guy, took that lamb and killed that lamb. David suddenly had a revelation. He's not talking about a lamb. He's talking about the lamb of God. I did not commit adultery with Bethsheba. I killed the Lamb of God. He said, I have sinned. You know Psalm 51, what he says? He says, against you, and you alone, have I sinned. He realizes every sin is against Christ. Every sin means I am personally responsible for his crucifixion. Ask this question. After that, did David fall? He didn't fall. What kept him from falling? The love of God. He said, Lord, I will not do this again. I need you. Faith to faith. The righteousness of God that comes from faith to faith. What does it mean? It suddenly means every step with God is a step of faith. One step you take, He shows you. You know what, James? Do you know these are the sins you are struggling with now? You didn't see it earlier. I am showing you. I have an opportunity. What is that? Either to turn back to God in repentance or be stubborn. He says every step after that will be a step of faith. Every step you take with me, righteousness will be added. It will be the righteousness of God given to you. Why? Because of the wrath of God upon Jesus. That's why we sing the song. There is this blood flowing from Calvary still. Why? What does it bring? It brings cleansing. It brings righteousness into our lives every day. In John chapter 14 and verse 21, this is what Jesus says. He who has my commandments and keeps them it is he who loves me. He who has my commandments. How do I have his commandments? Let me ask you this question. If you search, if you don't search, will you find his commandments? You have to look at construction very carefully. We'll say, but I don't have any commandments, God says, because you never searched. You did not search because you don't care. Everyone who is in love with me is forever looking for new and new ways to please me. And children, as small children, they'll do all kinds of silly, stupid things to please their parents. But we find great joy in it. Right? And as they grow up, they stop. What does God say? He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. John chapter 15, verse 10, he will say about abiding in his love. 
if you keep my commandments you will abide in my love in 1 john chapter 5 and verses 3 and 4 you will see something for this is the love of god that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not does it look burdensome question is that's the commandments what god is asking you Is it burdensome? He says his commandments are not burdensome. But it will never be burdensome or it will be light on our shoulders only if we love him. Otherwise, it, everything is burdensome. The issue always is about love. The issue is always about love. How is this possible? That's what God is saying. For whoever is born of God overcomes the world. Overcomes the world. Do we see the righteousness of God being revealed face to faith? That's why scripture says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why fear and trembling, Lord? Because he says, in the same gospel, what is being revealed? The wrath of God is also being revealed. On whom? On somebody else. Let me ask you this question. Shakina and Anisha are sitting together. Shakina and Anisha are the best friends. Every time Shakina lies, I slap Anisha. How long will she lie? Are you getting the picture? God says, do you know? God who sees the end from the beginning. God who is outside of eternity. For there is no time space every time you sin. One more on his hands. Do you see? That's how much he loves you. That's how much I will not wink at sin. I will not wink at sin. He says, do we come to that? He says, do you understand the horror of Calvary? To fight sin, he says, do you understand the horror of Calvary? That's why repentance is the first step to healing. And the first step to deliverance. Are you getting the picture? The religion of the unsaved always puts the blame on God or on others right from the beginning. Repentance is when I take personal responsibility. There may be others involved, but that's not what I say before God. I will say, you know what? I am responsible for my mess. First step of repentance. What did Adam say? The woman, you gave. What did the woman say? The serpent you made. It's been that way. That's why repentance is painful. John chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. The Jews surrounded him and said, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I told you, you do not believe. Look at the question. You know what they are saying? Jesus, you are responsible for our unbelief. That's what they are saying. That's how people also say, you are responsible for my failing. Jesus says, I have spoken to you. I have manifested to you. You don't believe. What can I do? I told you, but you don't believe. Are we getting the picture, church? Psalm 32 is a new covenant psalm by an old covenant man who knew the joy of being delivered not only from the penalty of sin, but also from the power of sin. Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom God does not impute iniquity. The power of sin is broken in my life. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. He said, that's the key. The key is that when God looks into the inward parts, he sees this fellow has truth, no guile. He doesn't say one thing and mean something else. That's 
that's what is so special about David's Psalms. You know, David, God has no issues with you venting before God. David goes and tells everything openly before God and by the time he ends, he'll say, praise God, I am fine. He never hides anything from God. If he's angry with somebody, he will tell that to God also. I'm angry with these fellows. I wish you would finish them off. By the time he finishes, God sets his theology right and sends him. <laughs> How did this happen? Look at verse 3 and 4. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. That is God's son, God's child. God says, you know why you are miserable? You feel so dry and empty because you won't repent. And I will not take my hand away from you. He said, when I kept silent, I knew you, I had tasted your goodness, I knew what you were like, but now I don't want to repent. God says, fine, don't repent. Don't repent. You know what joy of salvation is, right? I will take it away from you. That's why he cries, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. He says, you know what? The doorway to healing, the doorway to deliverance is always repentance. If you keep silent, God says, nothing is going to happen. He says in verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I am free. Question, am I just delivered from the guilt of sin? Or am I also delivered from the love of sin? This is the issue. Let me tell you, church, this is the issue. Our major issue is this because we don't understand the difference. If I'm right, 189 times the word love is used in the New Testament. It is never used positively with a thing. It's always used with man. Oh God, love God, love your neighbor. It is never used with anything else. We'll say, you know what? I love ice cream. I love shopping. God says, you know what? That's your problem. That's why you're not able to overcome. You can like ice cream. Do not love anything other than God and your neighbor. You know what's the primary meaning of fasting? Primary meaning of fasting is that I love God, I love my neighbor. Therefore, I can give up anything. We love a lot of things. We love a lot of things. Let me give you the negative examples of love in the Bible. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. For the love of money. What is it? The love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. God says you can like money, because money has its uses. But he says the problem is when you love money. When you love money, you would rather give up your neighbor than your money. One John chapter two and verse ten. No, the, I think it's verse 15. One second, let's get. Verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Why? Because if you love the world, the love of the Father is not. Did he say you cannot like the things in the world? There are certain things, many things you can like. But the problem is not with liking. The problem is with loving. When you love, you will not be able to give up. When you like, you can always give it up. There are a lot of things which I like. I was actually dealing with a believer this week. And the believer's struggle is that, I like drinking. I love alcohol. And I said, that's your issue. Your issue is that you actually love alcohol. You will never get delivered over as long as you love sin. If you love sin, you are never going to be delivered out of sin. The power of sin will always work over you. 
Because why? Because scripture says, love God with all your heart, all your might, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Nothing else. You know some of you, why you are in bondage to work? Because you love work. It's not that you like work. You love work. Therefore, what are you? Workaholic. In bondage. So even if God were to say, take two days off and sit in my presence, you can't. Why? Because you love work. But if you just like work and you don't love work, when God says, take seven days without pay and sit in my presence, you will take and go sit in his presence. Why? Because you neither love work nor you love money. You're free. Do you know as we walk with God, how many areas God will show us, you need repentance, son. You need repentance, daughter. You need to change your mindset. None of That's what Paul is saying. All things are permissible. All things are not beneficial. How does it affect my walk with God? How does it affect my walk with God? Why won't people take the first step of repentance? Because they love. Mark chapter 12, verse 38. Mark 12 and verse 38. Then he said to them, teaching, beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes. Why? Because the love greetings in the marketplaces. Do you know what that? This is people who love the approval from others. A lot of people love it. And if you don't get it, they cannot function. God said it is good to like. If your pastor says good job, that's good. But if you love it, then if you don't get it, you cannot survive. Did you see three things mentioned? The same thing is mentioned in the other gospels too. Love of money, love of the world and love of things, and love of appreciation. These things keep us. It's good to like these things, but you cannot love this. And when we do, what happens? We don't repent. Because the first step of repentance, first step, each one God deals with that. So he looked at Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus says, you know what, Lord? I loved money. And I wanted that acknowledgement from, from people. That is, I worked so hard. I'm the chief tax collector. Now you know what? I'm not bothered what they think about me. I'm not bothered about money. I love you. God says, salvation has come. Rich young ruler, what did he tell him? Sell everything and follow me. He went away sadly. If you love the world and the things of the world, it will be very difficult actually to serve God. Very difficult to serve God. What will people think? God says, confess. What will people think? What will people think? God says, what do you want? Healing? Deliverance? Or what people think? Whatever people think is just false anyway, right? Because it's an image you created. It's not true. You like that image, which is false. Do you want that image? Or do you want freedom? No. Why? Because they love greetings. How we love it. You know what? Wow. Jasant, you're such a praying lady. Shakina, you worship. What if Shakina stands up and says, you know, pastor, the only time I worship is at church. God says, you know what? I'm, I'm pleased with you, child. You're honest. Now I will teach you how to worship. Pastor, I'm not a praying lady at all. The only time I pray is when I'm called to pray. Are you getting the picture? That's what God is saying. Look at that man. There's no guile in his heart. And God is bringing us to that point, but we like the false gospel. Why? Seize the inheritance. Seize the inheritance. Seize the inheritance. Yet God says in that same psalm, 32 verses 8 and 9. I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. If you are willing. I don't want to get into it because it's a very long teaching. Each are three different things. They are not the same. He says, I will instruct you. One, 
bend his knees before God on the road to Damascus. Who are you? Christ Jesus. What will you have to do? I will tell you. Go. He's sitting in Damascus. God calls Ananias and says, you know what? You go to the man and you instruct him. He was instructed. God sends instructors into the lives of his people when they actually repent. He sends people who will teach you. More than that, he will guide you with his eye. You know what that means? Hebrews chapter, two, uh, after, after chapter 4 verse 13. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Do we like this verse? There was a lady who fought with her mistress and ran from her house. On the road, God met her and asked her, Hagar, Hagar, where are you coming from? Where are you going? She said, from my mistress. God said, go back to your mistress and submit to her. And then pronounces the blessing if she obeys. You know what she said? You are Beer Lahai Roy, the God who sees, whose eye is upon me. What does it mean? God doesn't speak to our situations. He looks straight into your heart and says, this is your problem. Do you want to obey or not? My eye sees what your issue is. Will you obey or not? That's what it means. When you walk with God, God says, my eye sees everything. You come to me, I will tell you exactly what your problem is. And it will take humbling. But you will have to go eat humble pie and say, this is what I am. Forgive me. And he says, you can walk with me. My eye sees. And I will then guide you with my eye. The very painful. That's why repentance is the message people hate most. We hate it most. What does scripture says? Can two walk together unless they are Agreed, Amos 3.3. 3. Can't you walk together? Can you walk with God? When he says, my eyes are upon you. My eyes are upon you. I see everything as it is. You want to walk with me? I will tell you. We are basically telling to God, change, 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 change. So I can walk with you. God says, no. You change, 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 so we can walk together. So what does it mean, you know, walked with God for 300 years and was no more? Can you just imagine with your mind what does it mean? How did this man walk and his eyes were upon him? He changed. He changed. He changed. He changed to the point God said, you know what? Come with me. Let's go. Walk by faith. And every step is a walk by faith. Every step, walk by faith. And you suddenly realize what Romans 10.23 says. 14.23 says, whatever is not of faith is sin. Why? Because his eye is upon you. Are you getting the picture? Think for a minute, logically think for a minute. Did, is it Paul who taught us through the Holy Spirit that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Did he teach us that? Then why did this man say, I am the chief of sinners and the worst of sinners? Because every step of faith he took, he realized this is what I am. And this is what he is. One more step closer to God, his uncleanness even more revealed. One more step you take, even more revealed. Is God condemning him? No. He says, I'm cleansing you. Keep walking with me. Keep walking with me. You're not a finished product, Paul. When I called you, I positionally placed you as righteous. Every step you take by faith. What is, that's what Romans 16 and 17 says. It is the righteousness of God is revealed what? Faith by faith. When we begin, we'll say, Lord, I sinned, forgive me. God says, forgive him. One step you take, you'll say, you know what, you lied. And he says, for your lie, I killed him. He says, okay, I will not lie. Then he says, you know what, you speak dirty language. Obscene talk. You know what, for that, I killed him. Say, okay, Lord, I realize I need grace, Lord. I don't want him being punished. One more step you take, you'll say, you know what, your thoughts are wicked. God says, for that, I punished him. As you keep on, he starts showing it. Faith to faith to faith. And you suddenly realize from the beginning till the end, righteousness comes only by faith. Who did the work? He did the work. Who was punished? 
he was punished and that is how you overcome the power of sin how do we understand the meaning of hebrews 10:38 Ten and verse thirty-eight. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul shall not be pleased with him. Let me ask you this question: Why do we draw back? I know personally the truth for myself. Every time I have drawn back, it's only because I had to repent. Otherwise, there is no drawing back. When I have to repent and say, "Go say sorry to this one," I draw back. When I have to say, change something which I like, I draw back. God says, if you draw back, I will have no pleasure in you because you have to decide who are you walking with. That's what he's saying. The just shall live by faith. What is it? Why does he live by faith if he doesn't want the righteousness of God? Why does he want to live by faith? There is a righteousness of God that is revealed, faith unto faith. So when you take one step, God says, I was pleased till. Last night, this morning, there is an issue. Can we deal with that? And I draw back. Sunday mornings we don't draw back because you have to preach. And he says, verse thirty-nine. He goes further and he says, "But we are not of those who draw back to." He says, "You know, there are people who draw back, draw back, draw back, draw back, draw back all the way to hell." Why? Now a wall has built. I won't forgive. I won't forgive. I won't forgive. I won't forgive. And I won't forgive. And God says, if you don't forgive, your Father in heaven also will not forgive. If my Father in heaven doesn't forgive, doesn't matter what I call him. How do I get into heaven? Relationship is true. Remember last few weeks back, I said, what did the rich man call out from hell? Father Abraham. What did Father Abraham say? My son. But where is one in paradise? Where is the other one in hell? Why? I believe it was unforgiveness. And what does he also realize? He realizes, please send Lazarus to my brothers so that they might repent. They knew repentance was involved. Are we getting the picture? Let me ask you this question. Of the available history in the Old Testament of the children of Israel who came out of the desert, except for the young generation, how many made it into the Promised Land? Two, right? Of all the available records in the Bible, in the Bible, not church history, in the Bible, how many do you know in the New Testament who finished the course? Two, Paul and Stephen was cut short suddenly, right? But Paul and John, me too. You're getting the picture. God is saying, you know what? Testimonies of who finished their walk of faith is very few, because everyone will draw back at some point. Like Demas, what happened? What the scripture says? Demas loved the world, didn't like the world, loved the world, and he went away. Let me close. But before I close, I want to read this. Oh, this story! You cannot just read this story. You will be shocked when you hear this story. Man called John Griffith. Okay, listen to this. Is in 1929 when the great stock market crash began. He was in his early 20s, newly married, full of optimism. Along with his lovely wife, he had been blessed with a beautiful little baby boy, and he was dreaming the American dream. And then one day it all crashed. Broken-hearted, John packed a few of his possessions with his wife and little son, Greg, and they headed in their old car. They made the way to Missouri, to the edge of Mississippi River. There he found a job tending to one of the great railroad railroad bridges that was going over the river. Day after day, John would sit in the control room and direct the enormous gears of an enormous bridge over the mighty river. Okay, it is. A drawbridge over which the train goes, and underneath the ship goes. So whenever ships has to pass, he has to lift the bridge. And he used to sit there and dream and dream and dream. And now his son is eight years old, and he was thinking about a day when he and his son will start a new business and start working together. 
And Greg used to come with his father to that place to see how his father operated the livers and everything. They used to sit and eat together and used to tell him all stories. One day when this all happening, they heard the whistle of the train. Suddenly, John looked at the watch and realized it was 107. Immediately, he realized the bridge was still raised and the Memphis Express was coming. Not wanting to scare his son, he suppressed his panic. In the calmest tone he could muster, he instructed his son to stay put. Quickly leaping to his feet, he jumped onto the catwalk and he ran full tilt to the steel ladder connecting to the control room. Once in, he searched the river to make sure no ships were in sight. And then as he was trained to do, he looked straight down beneath the bridge to make certain nothing was below. As his eyes moved downward, he saw something so horrifying that his heart froze in his chest. For there below in the massive gearbox that housed the colossal gears that moved the giant debris was his beloved son. He had fallen. Apparently, Greg had tried to follow his dad, but had fallen off the catwalk. Now he has wedged between the teeth of the two main cogs in the gearbox. Although he appeared to be conscious, John could see his son's leg was bleeding. And then he heard the whistle. For a minute, he thought, I will jump down, use a rope ladder, climb, get in. But he knew there was no time because the train was coming. And there were 400 people in the train. And he did not know what to do. Soon, the train would come roaring out of the trees with tremendous speed. But this, this was his only son, his only child, his pride, his joy. His mother, he could see her face now. This was their child, their beloved son. He was his father and this was his boy. He knew in a moment there was one thing and one thing alone he could do. And he knew he had to do it. So burying his face under his left arm, he plunged down the lever. The cries of his son was quickly drowned by the relentless sound of the bridge as it ground slowly into position. Within, with only seconds to spare, the train with 400 passengers rode out of the trees across the mighty bridge. He lifted his tear-stained face, looked into the windows of the passing train. A businessman was reading the morning newspaper. A uniformed conductor was glancing at his large pocket watch. Ladies were already sipping their afternoon tea in the dining cars. A small boy looking strangely like his own son was eating ice cream. Many of the passengers seemed to be encased in idle conversation or careless laughter. No one looked his way. No one even cast a glance at the giant gearbox in which remained the mangled remains of his little son. In anguish, he pounded the glass in the control room and cried out, What's the matter with you people? Don't you care? Don't you know I sacrificed my son for you? What is wrong with you? No one answered. No one heard. No one even looked. Not one of them seemed to care. Then as suddenly as it had happened, it was over. The train disappeared, moving rapidly across the bridge and out of the horizon. For this is but a faint glimpse of what the father did with his own son on the cross. God says, don't you care? Doesn't it bother you? Doesn't your sin bother you? Doesn't it bother you? Do you know what it cost me to redeem you? Let me tell you, church, biggest stumbling block in the world is repentance. Whether it is a Jew or whether it is a Gentile, you tell any man, whether he is Jew, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, Jain, any religion. You tell them Jesus is prophet, they love it. Jesus worker of miracle, they love it. Jesus the kind man, they love it. Jesus the healer, they love it. When you tell Jesus demands repentance in your life, they stop. And God demands repentance because the wrath of God is being revealed through the gospel, also the salvation of God. That is why Jesus crucified is a stumbling block. It's a stumbling block even within the church. Big stumbling block. For you and me, for all of us personally, repentance is a stumbling block. Because repentance demands change from me. And we don't like change. Why are our relationships messed up? Because it demands change. Why is our prayer life a mess? Because it demands change. 
Why is a work life a mess? Because it demands change. If you want to work as God says, it demands change from us. If you want to pray as God says and God wants to be there, a partner with you in prayer, it demands change. If you want to worship as God says worship and ask, wants him to hear your worship, it demands change. And we don't want to change. But we want our inheritance. So what do we do? We do like the people in the vineyard. What do we say? Let's kill him and seize his inheritance. So what do we do? We use the same gospel. The same gospel which came to us by the cross, through the cross and from the cross to seize our inheritance now. So we say in the name of Jesus, I believe for this. 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 I claim it. I name it. Why? We want our inheritance. We want our inheritance. We want our inheritance. That's where God says, you know what? I looked into your heart for what? To see there was no guile. I wanted to make you clean in your inward part so that there was only truth. Now let me tell you the last word when he talks about love in the new covenant. God talks about the last generation who is handed over to whom? To the devil. Why? Because they did not have the love for truth. Not love for grace. What did not they have? The love for truth. You know what? You look into your heart, you look into my heart. We don't love truth so much. Because truth demands what? Repentance. Truth demands repentance. And he says, you know what? Ultimately, I will have to hand these people over into the hands of the devil because that is my justice. If they receive truth, Salvation was available always on the cross. The blood was there flowing, cleanse you, empower you to keep walking. But because you will not acknowledge truth, I have to hand you over to what? To a lie. What is the lie? You can make it to heaven without change. You know that's a lie? That you can enter into the kingdom of God without, without righteousness. Now you understand why Jesus said, seek ye first. And his, where is the righteousness revealed? In the gospel. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It's revealed from faith to faith. That's the gospel. And we struggle with that gospel. That's what Paul actually says in Galatians. He says, if I or somebody else comes to you and preaches another gospel, let him be cursed. Am I right? Does he say that? Yeah, but look at verses 1 to 3 before you come to 7. I, Paul, an apostle, not from men or through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised from the dead and all brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God and our Father. He says, understand, this is the gospel. Who gave himself? For us, our sins. Why was he given? So the wrath of God could be fulfilled. The righteousness of God is revealed. He gave himself for our sins so that what? He may deliver us. But what if you don't want to be delivered from this age? I love this age. To deliver us from this age. Do we love? Ask this question. Do we love money? Do we love anything other than God and our neighbor? And do we love our neighbor in truth? Or do we love our neighbor in falsehood? And he shall be kind to me always. Okay, so I'll keep on telling whatever you want to hear. Our relationship with our neighbors is basically based on falsehood. It's not true. You know why? Because our neighbor itself is false. Because if you tell them what is true, they won't talk to you again. And say, you are condemning me. You are judging me. So most of our interpersonal relationship is false. It's not true. God says, will you repent? 
Are you willing to face? That's why Jesus said, the world will hate you because of me. Try telling the truth to your spouse. The pastor repeats, and you will be mad at pastor. The pastor said, Lord, you speak to them directly. I'm tired. Why? Because people are not serious about walking with you. When people are serious with walking with you, then they will come on their own. Their own. Otherwise, repentance is like a burden. The one who wants to walk with God, repentance is the best word. Because you know, that gets you closer and closer and closer and closer with God. So what does that mean about Enoch? Enoch walked 300 years in repentance. And God said, you're clear now. Come. No immigration, no visa, nothing needed. Let's go. Shall we stand? Father, as it is written in your word, we do not want to be enemies of the cross. Because in the cross, on the cross, the righteousness of God is revealed. It's only when we actually look at the cross, we will realize how you hate evil and how you love righteousness. Nothing can move us if the cross doesn't move us. I pray, Father, that all of us, when we sin, when we walk in rebellion, when we walk in disobedience, in our mind's eye, you would show us what it cost you. To forgive us what it cost you. To free us, if we are willing, from the penalty of sin. I pray people will have the courage to confess to you and confess to one another. So this cycle of sin, the cycle of wounding would stop before it moves to demonization. For whether one wants to be forgiven or healed or set free, repentance is the first step. And I pray, Father, you will give us that repentance, a change of heart. That is what, Lord, circumcision of the heart means. When your work is over, we will love nothing but love you and love our neighbor. Let there not be the love of anything else in our hearts, O oh God. Then we are slaves, slaves of this enemy. For he has used things and false pleasures to hold us in bondage. But you said when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict us of sin. He will lead us to the truth, the truth that sets us free. And I pray for everyone who's truly tired, sick of their sin, their deliverance is close. But for the others who still love their sin, I pray, Lord, as your servant, as the shepherd, I pray you will make them sick and miserable in their sin until they are willing to forsake it. And then deliverance is just a breath away. For you can deliver no man who still loves his sin. And all who is struggling and miserable about their failings, I pray, Father, your hand will be there upon them. And they will experience what David experienced in Psalm 32. When I confessed, he set me free. When I made myself accountable, the power of iniquity was gone. But those who love their sin, because you love them, I pray, Father, let them be miserable. Let them be miserable until they realize the call and the purpose of God is much bigger, much bigger than this life. Be with us, Lord. Speak to us through this day in the quiet hours of the night. Speak to us. 
Because repentance is not something to be sloppy about, delayed. As we heard on Wednesday, when it comes to repentance, there is an urgency. There is an urgency, O Lord, when it comes to repentance. There is an urgency because of the price that was paid. There is an urgency. Because your word talks about, tells us about seeking you when you may be found. For the day and the hour is coming when you won't be found. Help all of us constant walk from faith unto faith until you have finished your work in each one of us. As we go, may your presence tarry with each one of us. Each one. Conviction where conviction is needed. Healing where healing is needed. Deliverance where deliverance is needed. You are able, more than able, O oh God, Holy Spirit. We release ourselves into the hands. Do your ministry in us and among us. So that at the hour of your coming, we may be that part of that pure, chaste virgin prepared for Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We praise you, God. We worship you, God. We give you glory and honor. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each one of us. Amen.